This morning, in a rare burst of domestic industry, and I can assure you that is rare, I pulled out the vacuum <laughs> and attacked the dog hair that sheds as we let our dog's hair grow longer for the winter. This afternoon, I was driving and was struck by a memory of Michelle, hoovering, as she liked to say, deriving pleasure from vacuuming her home each morning. And I'm sure I was channeling Michelle for this evening in anticipation of this very special gathering. I hope the moment strikes me again. <laughs> Welcome, dear friends. I am Laurie Norton Moffat, Director and CEO of Norman Rockwell Museum. I know many of you here tonight, but not all of you, and we are delighted uh, to welcome you, and it's our great pleasure to host this special evening in remembrance of our dear friend, Michelle. Mo most of you here tonight were friends of Michelle's, but we may have some members of the public who didn't have the pleasure of knowing her and will learn a lot about Michelle tonight. And because you know her so well, I thought I would tell you a little a bit about a different aspect of Michelle, her work with Norman Rockwell Museum over many years. Michelle served for 15 years as a trustee of this museum, as well as being first and second vice presidents over the years. She joined the board shortly after the opening of this building in 1993. Poet, teacher, writer, columnist, mother, wife, daughter, friend, Michelle added creativity and wisdom to the museum through all of her roles, illuminating board meetings with her thoughtfulness, staunch support of the artistic mission, and shaping our writing and communications for the better. I remember when Michelle taught a poetry workshop for our staff. Everyone can write poetry, she said. Sit with your thoughts, put them on paper. And in another karmic moment this week, my dear retired assistant, Ann Sterlin, happened to cross her set of workshop papers from Michelle's poetry workshop, which she'd not seen in a very long time. And these were really wonderful inspirations to help all of us find our poetry. Michelle contributed her writing skills to the museum, writing our museum story for campaign materials, and she was a leader, teacher, program presenter, and planner for our 40th anniversary celebration. She developed inspiring program ideas for the museum and continued bringing intellectual enrichment to our community through the much-loved Stockbridge Library Sunday afternoon speaker series, which continues to this day. Michelle held an MFA in writing from the Warren Wilson program. She was an award-winning poet, having won fellowships from the Massachusetts Cultural Council and published work in numerous literary magazines. She was the author of Blinding the Goldfinches and the Green Cottage and winner of many poetry prizes, including the 2005 Backwaters Prize, the 1998 Billy Murray Denny Poetry Award, and MacGuffin Poet Hunt in 2001. Her poetry was widely published, and some years ago, she had the audacious idea to bring United States Poet Laureate Billy Collins to Stockbridge for a reading, and this community filled the Congregational Church to capacity. I believe we were hanging off the balcony and something like the full galleries here tonight. It's daunting to write and speak about a brilliant writer. Michelle taught me and hundreds of her students how to write more clearly, more meaningfully. Scratch those adjectives, make declarative sentences, write how you would speak. She also helped many women find their voice in our community, urging us to write op-ed pieces in regional press. Why not aim for national press, she advocated. The Berkshire Festival of Women Writers owes great gratitude for her leadership. She truly inspired a community of writers in the creative Berkshires. Her columns in the Berkshire Eagle were widely read, and I would say are missed today, inspiring thought about family, women's issues, matters of community, and national importance, always with the intent to make society just a little better. 
With her steadfast will, she wrote her columns until the very end of her life, an utter marvel, advocating gender equity, women's rights, and redressing society's wrongs. She left a void in our community of a sage, brave voice to redress inequities and educate our citizens to issues of importance. And I hope we all know that it is our responsibility now to carry on this work. This evening, we celebrate the posthumous publication of Michelle's new book of poetry, Coming About. And we thank the Gillettes for the honor to offer a reading of these poems amongst her friends and family here tonight and are grateful to her publisher, Four Way Books, uh, for this um, early launch of the book. So now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to her family and friends. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, Aaron, Lisa, and I would like to welcome you all here. Um, unfortunately, Aaron, at the last minute, could not um, fly across the country, and um, um, Lisa and I, and many or most of you in this room, miss seeing her today. I would first like to thank Lori uh, and <coughs> Stephanie Plunkett, who is the curator of the museum, and the staff of the Rockwell Museum for allowing, uh, for putting on this wonderful reading. Um, there's a lot of people here. Um, I sort of I shouldn't say this, but I guess there might be a lot of people, and I'm really happy that you're all here to, um, to, be, uh, to hear the reading of Michelle's book. Um, I'd like to also thank Martha Rhodes, who is the publisher of Four Way Books. Uh, she's going to follow me to the podium. Um, I do want to tell you a little story about, <clears throat> Michelle was on the, um, um, on the board of Four Way Books uh, with um, Martha and um, Owen and others. Um, and um, when she, she was very excited in the beginning of 19, uh, uh, 2015 that she knew her book was going to be published by Salmon Press, uh, which is in Ireland. And <clears throat> she was thrilled. She was a little annoyed that she had to wait two years from 2015 to 2017 uh, to see the book. Uh, but I told her to be patient, and uh, she said she would. And when she got um, sick, um, Martha came to visit, and Michelle and she talked, and I understand from both of them separately that um, Martha agreed to sort of shepherd the book a bit in the United States. And then, um, as these things happened, Martha was at a um, uh, was a book, what would you call it, a book, book conference in Los Angeles, and she ran into Jeannie, who was the publisher in, uh, uh, of Salmon Press in Ireland, and they talked, and um, it was suggested maybe that Martha might do it, and Martha sort of seized the moment and agreed to uh, publish it, much to um, our um, happiness, that is Aaron and Lisa and mine, because we've known Martha forever and ever. Um, so it's really, uh, it's an amazing thing, and Michelle would be very, very pleased that Four Way Books is the publisher. I'd also like to thank quickly Jackie Malone, who organized this reading. Uh, she sent out emails, arranged for the readers, all of whom are friends of Michelle's. Um, they're all fine poets in their own right. And lastly, I'd like to just say that, um, I gotta find my note. Um, um, here it is. Um, my daughter Lisa flew from Albuquerque. Uh, two of Michelle's sisters are in the room. My brother and his wife are in the room. And two of our nieces are in the room. Um, Lisa, um, Michelle's freshman roommate from Skidmore is in the room. And last but not least, but I'm not going to tell you who she is. You'll have to figure it out later. But there's a lovely woman in the room that uh, Michelle used to babysit for when this woman was probably six or seven and Michelle was probably 15 or 16. So, uh, but you have to guess who that is. That's, that's your charge. So thank you all for coming. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, 
Jackie, thank you for organizing, Chuck, Lisa, Aaron, and all of you. Uh, at the memorial service for Michelle, I mentioned that she left us something to look forward to, and um, I really meant it from my heart. Um, that this, this book is a wonderful book. Um, was it a sentimental choice to bring the book in? Well, actually, four-way books can't make sentimental choices. We have a very small list, and we receive a couple of thousand um, submissions each year for a tiny list. So um, this, um, and as my good friend, many of my good friends know, I don't necessarily take books by my good friends. Um, <laughs> um, most of them understand that. Uh, so, when I think about, I'm often asked, um, what makes a poem come to life for me? Why a certain book? Why a certain poem? And I think what you're going to hear today are, is a speaker who is allowing us access to her mind as it's working. Um, we think of that as mind in action. We can actually hear the speaker's thoughts being articulated on the page. Very keenly observant mind, heart, and um, I'm just going to leave it at that. I knew Michelle as a, as a dear friend, as, as someone who worked with me. Um, Jackie, Michelle, and I took writing retreats together where much of our books were written, poems written, and uh, this book is very dear to me. So with that, Vespids. It's down, the hornet's nest. Now first sting of frost on the ground, and we see no threat, only the hollow where harm lived. Everything the season housed has flown, yellow jackets idling low in the grass, bats fanning the dusk, the hornets threading close to the roof. When we were children, we'd leap from our beds, arms flung wide. In the seconds before landing, we didn't know fear resides in gravity or stars fall into themselves. We imagined rising over the roofs, like, not like souls detached from bodies, but as bodies resisting the world. Light in my hands when I lifted it from the eve, fervor gone, no longer wadded in industry. This testament to vanishings is too fragile to hold. Dead man's float for my father. Forever, it seems, he would lie there, sun glossing his back, his tanned bald head, lotion slick, face down in the salt water pool, arms and legs outstretched, July afternoon boxed in turquoise cement, black tile numbers measuring depth. Told to count the seconds he floated motionless, water deaf, we sat, legs dangling over the edge. It was all we could do, not to reach for him, to shout him back, the dead man was pretend. He was teaching us to swim, the water holding him the same way memory does, nudging him forward, drifting him back. How he startled us when he rose, laughing. See how easy it is. Light streams down his face before he holds his invisible breath and lies down in the water again. I knew Michelle from the Warren Wilson community. I knew her to be a wonderful human being and a wonderful writer. So when I was asked to give an endorsement for the back cover, the last sentence uh, reads, Coming About is a brave and beautiful book by a poet greatly gifted both in her humanity and her craft. Those are very true words for those who know Michelle and her work. <clears throat> Barred Owl. Don't think he doesn't know you're there, asleep in the cottage on Inner Road, 
as he delivers packets of mouse and finch along the gravel drive, slick fur and feather, indigestible tail and bone, for you to discover in the morning when you go out to walk the dogs. He leaves them for you, waking to his hoo-hoo so close to the window beside the bed. Bird of prey calling you out, stalking the smallest shadows. He swallows them whole, the way you try to swallow grief, father, mother dying in turns, and after them, the sister who asks for songs, all night rubbing her back, half remembering words to night and day, blue moon. His repeated notes trouble your soul. You who are nothing but gristle and gut cannot thrive on darkness. Hi. Michelle was one of my first writing mentors and uh, she was a devoted teacher who quickly became a close and cherished friend and I miss her terribly but I'm very thankful to have her books of poetry. I keep all of her books beside my desk within arm's reach um, and they just remind me of her insight and her quiet wisdom and her unflinching um, attentiveness to this beautiful and messy world. Arrhythmia. April morning, the disturbance of light in the room and the light disturbances. Cat scratching the door, newspaper on the floor, the clock's digital glow. The dream I have yet to shake. I feel my heart turn strange an unfamiliar fluttering. Nothing serious, the doctor said, but I don't know what it wants, tapping out this new code, while pear blossoms screen the sky white on white. Shouldn't I give it pause, the body shifting its gait when I still feel affection for the world? It will happen soon enough. Heart, more out of step each day. The catch in the morning's pulse once reliable as my needs, sleep, breath, the light that stirs me awake. I place my hand on my chest to feel the curious beat like someone hurrying to find me, but when I turn there is nothing that will not wait. Hi, it's so great to be here, and I'm so thankful to be part of the community of Michelle, um, which I became part of when I was chatting with somebody at coffee hour at the Stockbridge Church and saying, oh, I'm going to start this MFA program at Warren Wilson College. And she said, oh, Michelle went to Warren Wilson. And little did I know that that would open up this um, the wonderful network of Michelle, <laughs> um, through which, of course, I also met some other wonderful friends. Um, so I'm grateful not only for her friendship, but for, for those friendships that grew out of, out of it. We inherit the house. Goldenrod invades the beds Bees haze the yellow clusters. She knelt here once, yanked the stubborn roots, called me from the house to stake the asters. We tied them to poles with strips of nylons. Behind glass doors, China shepherdess, stereopticon. Piano rolls turned out summertime by the light of the silvery moon. Rainbow trout on the counter, slit from tail to throat. Lettuce rinsed in the colander, the table set for company. Delphiniums in the porcelain vase. She swam early mornings, towel hung on a birch limb, the water smudged with mist. 
Of course, we kept the photographs, but what would we want with her evening clothes? Clutches, sequined and pearled, moth-chewed wraps. Before she died, she would sit by the lake, reading a book, her mind already losing its place. No good to us, the finger bowls and miniatures, the buttons saved in jars. Spectral as our faces in the window, the past makes its way, makes way for the next accumulation. Someone touches the piano keys. Someone raises a glass. Hello. Um, so Michelle was at my wedding, um, I don't know, 40 something years ago. And uh, Chuck was there and Lisa and Aaron. Um, she was also at my mother's uh, funeral um, two years ago or so. Um, I knew everything about her, I think, and she knew everything about me. Um, we met in a writing group um, in 1975 in the fall uh, in West Stockbridge. Uh, Barry was there and a few other people. Uh, and we uh, were in writing groups together throughout the years until the time when she died. So um, I miss her a lot. And um, we were kind of like, kind of like sisters, with no disrespect to her actual sisters. Um, we drew and painted together throughout the years, and she was an attentive godmother uh, to my sons. This is the final day of years of sweetness, Petrarch 314. Wormwood, eyesore. The orchard trees no longer cared for. Still, we pick up windfalls, pull spotted fruit from branches, take them home to boil down, counting on the flavor. Sweetest at season's end, like the changes we've outlived. One death after another. Our parents keep their distance now, ashes tended by stone. We slipped the rings from their fingers, bands of stones, a diamond, two sapphires, and begin to take for granted days without bad news. This is the first we have lived in abundance, this is what absence bestows. Sun rakes the hills, branches fill with sky. It's almost too much. The earth's sweet insistence steadies us when we walk the path that keeps us fixed to the world like a finger on the book, keeping the page when we look away. We are only a stone's throw from losing our place now that the stories are told. Sweeter yet, apples cooking, time stopping over the house. Before long, deer will come out of the woods, shift under branches to eat windfalls we left. Nothing we said can be taken back. We live unencumbered by guilt. Her skin turned livid. His eyes wouldn't close. We don't mind that they keep to themselves. Soon the rest of the leaves will fall from branches. Later today, rain changing to snow. The stone sundial in the garden keeps time by shadows. By four o'clock, it's nearly dark. My sister stirs the pot. Is it sweet enough, she wants to know. We like it tart, just a little sweet. She passes me the spoon. We've had our taste of final days. 
lifeless hands against our lips. One last kiss before the cold takes hold. Memory stores them for us, death's keepsakes, like November's final offerings. Stones on the path, mica flecked, dry husks, spiked rosettes, the twisted branches lichen. There is always more to gather, branching past season's end. I learned the dead are not sweet-tempered, refusing to answer, to look at our faces. Stony-hearted, they ignore our voices. When they were alive, they said they loved us. Now we keep to ourselves a happiness we did not know before they left, broken like branches, distinct from their bodies, living our lives without them. Grief can be forfeited. Nothing's worth keeping as much as this sweetness where each day is the next to the last one. Hi. Um, I met Michelle about 30 years ago when her oldest daughter, Erin, went home one day and said, Mom, I think I found you a friend. And sure enough, we met and we've, we're good friends ever since. Um, there are lots and lots of memories and, and this book certainly brings back lots of um, aspects of Michelle and lots of memories. But there's one in particular that I can't leave out this time because Chuck reminded me back at the Edith Wharton reading that Michelle was a bridesmaid in my wedding and, and she, was, she had never been a bridesmaid before and she was so happy to finally be a bridesmaid. <laughs> so, um, the poem I'm going to read is called Bear and I remember many times Michelle talking about how afraid of bears that she is. Uh, but it doesn't sound like it in this poem. You can decide. The neighbor is trying to sail a kite, but it lifts no higher than a fence. Still his children cheer and laugh. What matters is possibility. After all, it's spring, everything attempting to rise. A few mosquitoes, newly hatched, speck the air, hunger propelling them like the bear I saw last night from the bedroom window. Incongruent in my suburban yard, pulling the feeder down, scooping up seed. He rocked and split the rail fence, climbing over, then ambled away. Fluid and lithe as a fat man who is light on his feet, like the one who waltzed with me at my sister's wedding, suit jacket gaping, his paw on my back, <laughs> guiding me as if I too could dance in my first pair of heels, my daisy crown and yellow dress. Black bears are rarely dangerous, who else would lead me to the floor? It could have been Moonlight Serenade or one of those songs we hum now and then, surprising ourselves with memory, something familiar, exciting the dark, drawing us near. I met Michelle uh, at Breadloaf in the 80s. Um, I think it was maybe 1980, because we've known each other. We had known each other for a long time. Um, and immediately we became good friends. And she visited me in Gloucester, where I lived at the time, and told me that she was going to go to Goddard College to get an MFA. Well, I followed her. <laughs> and we both graduated eventually from Warren Wilson with MFAs. Um, and as I said, we became really close friends. Um, so it's one of those things, I really miss her. 
This poem I'm going to read, um, I think you'll recognize what is behind this poem if you're more than 25 years old. Um, the poem is called Rowing from Mohegan to Manana. I leaned into the dinghy's oars, pulling through the brightness, Indian summer brightness, mute and clear, as if earlier the portable radio in the lobster shack had not buzzed with bad news, and the lobsterman in his red socks cap and faded t-shirt, painting his buoys as he always did every September had not beckoned me inside. Something terrible has happened, he said. I moved closer to the words until we were complicit in the salt-pocked windows, the torn shade, the swag of shocking pink buoys, the radio repeating itself as island light spilled through the narrow door into the silence we kept until he returned to his work and I walked down the path to the beach where rowboats shouldered each other, trash smoldered in metal drums and gulls feasted on corn cobs and lobster shells. Between herring gut and snotty nose, smutty nose, I'm sorry, between herring gut and smutty nose, rocks clinched the harbor. The pharaoh, ferry blustered. Jeez, I'm sorry. <laughs> Once I mess up, I really mess up. Um, between herring gut and smutty nose, rocks cinched the harbor. The ferry blasted its horn near Pemaquid Point. I needed somewhere to settle the fear that rose with each stretch of oars, threading me like light through strands of water. But when I climbed the wooden steps to everything abandoned, the signal house, keeper's dwellings, boathouse and bell, gone too was the sense that anything can keep us. There was nothing to hold, so I crouched low. Under my palms, lichen rust clung to stone. Deep down inside, I am afraid of the lungfish. Suspended in its tank in the darkened room, meant to emulate time when desert was ocean, and ocean was all there was before we crept on our stubs from the watery hem of existence and blinked at undiluted light. There was no going back, although we still lacked breath enough to inherit the earth. Head down, in its gloomy tank, God's first creature, made in his own image before we began to fill at home in shallows and muck, grew legs and arms, sucked in air and named ourselves, is who we are, bone and gut. God's face before we invented it, stone-like, wide mouth feeding on every element. Hello. Um, Michelle and I were uh, editing partners and very good friends. And also she uh, taught me uh, poetry. And um, usually around this time of year, we did a lot of stuff together. We would go to, to readings and go to the Red Lion Inn for glasses of wine, and um, a few years ago I called her, and uh, I just called her to say, hi, you know, how are you? And she said, oh, fine, 
just the usual despair. And <laughs> I think that's what I really loved about Michelle. Is <laughs> and I think, um, I think that's kind of what she wrote about a lot. Hold on, I have to get my copy that I can see. Summer House Ledger. Little black book purchased to record what is broken, needs replacing, is about to fall apart. My sister notes a robin's nest over the front door. Bit by bit, the bird arranged her future the way we dream our human one. All summer, we enter reparations, closet light cord, canoe paddles split in two. We haven't registered sadness yet, though the eggs in the nest are doomed by departures and my sister transplants lilies of the valley certain they will come back next year, spread beneath the laurels. They ought to know better. Mother bird at the hub of screen door traffic. Woman kneeling in the dirt, thinking she has another summer left. Hello, everybody. I knew Michelle, like a lot of people here, from Warren Wilson circles. And the last time I saw her was in late October of 2015, when she was one of the winners of a, comp a poetry competition that I helped to judge for the Northampton Arts Council. I should add, I, the, count, the uh, competition was judged anonymously. I didn't, know, I didn't know that it was Michelle's poem I was choosing. It was just one of the best. And uh, so she and Chuck drove over uh, to Northampton f so she could participate in the reading at, at Forbes Library. And what I remember about that night is that she was beautiful and fit and happy and that she had made a breakthrough with her writing. I had always admired her writing, but she was writing with new depth and power and looking life right in its face, as this beautiful book records. I'm going to read a poem from the end of the book. Pond Road, Truro. Two boys fling their lines where midges swarm above green plates of lily pads. Late summer heat defies the change that's coming. Hydrangeas near the porch are purpling. Past dusk, hemlocks cast longer shadows. A plaque beside the pond observes the place pilgrims first drank in the new world. Up to their knees, indifferent to history, the boys want to catch something big. They don't think the season's getting smaller or crave its return like I do. I have stayed longer than usual in the rented house as if buying time were possible to purchase back days when the rooms were filled with family. But here's what I have come to, the mug of green tea on the desk, the dog by the kitchen door waiting. Not emptiness exactly, but a uh, tempering as if I've been reduced. Who am I to wish it otherwise? Surveyor of cattails, the boys snagging pond weed, the light streaming over them. I have leased these extra hours. They are not mine. I am like those first settlers crouched in the reeds, not sure where they belong, 
though, though they have reached their destination. Uh, this uh, beautifully written and designed collection brings Mich Michelle's presence back to me real strong. And uh, I'm deeply grateful for it. I, you know, I look at that bright, smiling photograph of her on the back there, and it seems like she's sitting right across the table from me, uh, ready to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> or, or, or right, or whatever. I badly miss that sweet disposition of hers, which made hanging out and talking shop so, such a pleasure. Uh, right from the start, all those years ago, it was a gift the way she could read and listen so closely, treating details and craft as if the world depended on them. Uh, in every way, she was a mindful, talented, generous, and cherished friend. I bet, way back when, if we were kids together in school, she would let me copy her homework. <laughs> and cheat off her on tests. <laughs> Not that I would actually do that. Uh, no way, uh, you know, but there were plenty of creepy kids out there that would. <laughs> well, it's an honor to be a part of this celebration and to read the title poem of Michelle's last, but also lasting collection. Coming about. The boat moves the water the way air lifts pages in the book on the table by the window. Salt breeze fills the jib. Coming about, the boat leans close to the surface. They almost touch the real and reflected. The boat is turning back to the dock. In a wake of light, the water hurries after. I was going to say, I love you, but the day half finished like a story that keeps unfurling, foreshadows a different ending. Why else would I put down the book and wait for you to come through the door? I want to thank you all for showing up time and time again. Thank you for taking care of my dad and for taking care of us. Thank you to the Norman Rockwell Museum, to Lori, to Jackie, and to Martha, and everyone at Four Way Books. Thank you for giving us the opportunity and the space to celebrate my mother and present her new book of poetry. I miss my mom. The grief concussion seemingly healed. I still wake up in the morning having to remind myself before I hit the snooze button for the first time that my mom is dead. Eventually, after I hit the snooze button for the second time, I, des I decide to get up anyway because that is what we do. We just keep getting out of bed and we keep on living because there's so much more to do, so much more to learn, children to care for, and so many people to help. We are never the same after losing someone so very close to us, and it is true, you do still feel them, and sometimes you see them. My mother continues to give me meaningful gifts. When she died, she gave me permission to be my authentic self, and she shows me that love is indeed a color. In a dream, she gave me a basket of black puppies, and a few months later, we welcomed a goofy, adorable Labrador into our lives. Luna never stops reminding me that it is not time to work, it is time to play. At the beginning of the day, and at the end of the day, my mom is not gone. She remains beautifully, peacefully, and simply there, especially when I'm beyond tired and feeling like I have so much to do. She stops me and tells me to leave it for the morning. 
Then she tucks me into bed. I miss my mom and her long tan legs that I wrapped my small self around on the beach. I miss visiting her for long and short periods of time. I often wiped bits of makeup out of the corners of her eyes and asked her with a smile on my face, what do you do when I'm not here? <laughs> I miss the messages she left on my phone in her youthful voice. Hi, Lee, it's mom calling, just checking in. Hi, Lee, it's mom calling, did you get your flu shot? I want to tell her that I did get my flu shot this year, and for the first time, it made me sick. <laughs> and she would most likely say, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> my mom gave us so many gifts then and now. Her book coming about is something we will all treasure and hold for the rest of our lives. I think we all read her poetry a bit differently than we would if she were alive. We dig deeper into the imagery and metaphors. She comforts and embraces us with her words. We are constantly looking for her, and in her poetry, we find her. My dad said, there are two things that my mother was the most proud of, having her work published and her daughters. I am so very proud of my mom. My mom is Michelle Gillette, and she is a poet. So now I'm gonna read it's a poem. Mm. Bleeding Heart. The garden has its own language. Heart's ease, fever few, bishop's weed, wild asters, wild roses, Roses that resist, disease, mildew, black spot blight. Some leaves sicken in the rain. Peonies drop their pink pinks. I pluck shimmering beetles from their green. My granddaughter wants to know the names, each color shape meaningless until a word delivers it into a likeness, coral bells, what shines and rings she knows from picture books. But here are petals spurred like an eagle's claw, clustered like dove's columbine. I tell her Achillea from the Latin. She likes best the little purses hanging from their hooks, bleeding heart, dicentra from the Latin dis meaning two. On the one hand, sorrow, on the other, love, whether falling in or out of it, whether here now, gone tomorrow, time takes us to heartbreak, closer than we want. Daffodils. Some effort of light keeps the dusk unfinished, Lying on my back, stretching the leg muscle, tight from having bent over the flower beds, planting for a season I can only imagine. All I see through the skylight is sky and what moves over it, a V of geese, a cloud, a leaf. These are all we need of memory, what passes through the firmament, what the dead would see looking up, if time made no barrier between coming and going. My mind keeps the after images, skein of birds, cloud, leaf, and leaf, what my hands held before burying. 300 bulbs huddle under the earth, 300 odds against weather. When the darkness takes over, I close my eyes, everything, Everything is just where I left it. Thank you, Lisa. You really brought her to 
to life and present with all of us. And thank you to our readers. And I know this really was a celebratory moment of all that Michelle gave to all of us. And tears are part of that in her absence. And we miss her. And she's present. So I want to thank you all for coming tonight to share in this moment with Michelle's family and friends. And if you don't yet have your book, um, you can pick up a copy in the museum store if you'd like to have your very own copy. And we have a wonderful reception in the lobby that I hope you'll all stay and linger and enjoy and share your, your memories um, of Michelle. Thank you so much for coming.